Welcome back to Fiber Festival. We're here in our final session of our uh, hybrid conference. And uh, well, I thought it would be nice at this point to maybe also recap just a little bit of where we've been uh, so far. We started uh, yesterday afternoon um, looking at um, some very difficult uh, topics, challenging topics around geoengineering and what we are doing with our uh, future environment, how humans have impacted the environment, and what we can really do to enact change. The answer is there are no easy answers. And then today we started looking at some different artistic projects that also inspire us to consider more deeply the human impact on the planet, but also, again, looking at empowerment and how we can manage change. Some, some I would say, common threads have arisen throughout the two days. It's kind of hard to pin it all down. It's very diverse and covers quite a lot of ground. But, uh, for example, I would say that the topic of responsibility comes up quite a lot, and also uh, trying to learn new ways of being. For example, trying to become much more comfortable with uncertainty, trying to become more comfortable with a non-human-centered uh, way of being, considering other living beings more deeply, perhaps. Um, and trying to uh, get comfortable with instability, to, to just give a shout out to our festival theme, to, to instead of uh, trying to manage everything, to perhaps take our hands off the wheel a bit and accept um, certain things. While not evading, of course, the, our responsibility to course correct some of our more egregious mistakes. So I think that sums up a little bit where we've been in our final session uh, right now, systems of support. We're going to be looking at uh, the crises and challenges of uh, realizing a post-capitalist and livable future. So what, what's that going to look like? Artists and researchers, of course, are speculating and working on alternative technologies, ecological restoration, and new ways to support ecosystems and cultures. And in this panel, we're going to share these developments, get to know the people behind them, and uh, look at their challenging ideas for the future. So, I dare to say we're going to end on another kind of challenging but hopeful note where we're looking at possible solutions and trying to weigh out what's, uh, what's good and bad about all of them. We have a, another hybrid uh, panel with some people joining me here on the table and uh, some, well, uh, some pre-recorded statements actually from some other people. So I'm going to just briefly introduce uh, our panelists. We're going to start with Abdel Hassan, who's a researcher and critical theorist. He's seated here to my left. Um, we're, there, we're then going to go to uh, Ruben Jacobs, who's seated uh, at the end of the spaceship here, um, <laughs> an author, and uh, welcome, welcome to our crew. We also have my, my uh, co-host, <laughs> Rianne, who's going to be taking uh, comments, so that's the spaceship crew for now. Uh, we also have a recorded statement from uh, someone who needs no introduction, Kim Stanley Robinson, a well-known novelist. And then after the session and our questions and uh, debate that we will have, um, we'll then close and then we'll have from Beo Akomalefe uh, a epilogue or statement, if you will. Um, and uh, that will round out our program for, for today. So now we're going to transition into our uh, speaking program. We're going to, I'm going to hand the reins over to you, Abdel, and uh, take it away and tell us all about your, your research and what you're working on right now. All right, uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, to start, uh, my name is Abdurrahman Hassan, and I uh, am a digital anthropologist, software engineer. And I really uh, try to bridge the gap between theory and practice. And I try to really infuse the work that I do with critical theory, because it's, I think it's a really important conversation that is often left outside of tech. So speaking of common threads between all the uh, uh, projects and insights that we've gathered so far, uh, I think one uh, uh, overarching theme or one common thread has always been speculative design and world building. There's always been uh, this idea that we need to uh, imagine a new world. We need to put our imaginative uh, capa capacities to the test. And I'm here to talk about this world building process, specifically when it comes to data. I want to talk about what's wrong with this, what could go wrong with this uh, world building process. And so that is kind of the challenge that I'm presenting, but there's also a promise that, hey, it could also be different. So my presentation is then conveniently titled How to Decolonize the Web and Other Stories. So just to go, I want to start with the claim that world building is really a very common process already. 
So it is sometimes presented as a novel solution, but it's a very common uh, process when it comes to science fiction, when it comes to uh, scientific innovation, when it comes to technological innovation. A very short description and a very basic description of world building would say that, uh, hey, it's only writers and, and science fiction uh, and, and fiction authors, sorry, uh, are people who, uh, who engage in world building. So you have all these worlds, fictional universes, you have histories to these fictional universes, you have imagined interactions around these fictional universes. But a, a, very, a very quick look at the geography of movies around us would tell us that we are in a constant state of envisioning our technological future. So there is a movie about a guy who falls in love with his AI, or a, a, a movie about uh, a guy who infuses himself within the AI and becomes transcendent. And the common thread between all these movies is that they're always dystopic. There are always dark futures. And there is something wrong about this. There's something unsettling about this. And there's a lot of anxiety about our future um, when it comes to technological innovation, when it comes to the world we'll bu we're building. Mm -hmm. Because, first of all, we don't know who's building these worlds, who's, who's engaged in this very uh, omnipresent and uh, uh, this uh, very discursive process. And we don't know for who these worlds are being built. And it's often very important to note that science fiction is important because it often becomes science fact. <laughs> and Exhibit A is a video that I, I kind of studied these type of videos for a while. It's a video that was released by the Abu Dhabi government to envision the future for their city. Like, it's a safe city. And you look at the video, there's a perpetrator, someone has done a crime, <laughs> and um, the whole city becomes this one monolithic structure to be able to... Um, catch this perpetrator. So there's uh, eyes in the sky, there's face recognition technologies on the ground, uh, nothing is out of sight. It's very reminiscent of uh, the Terminator Skynet, um, that really nothing is out of reach. Uh, there's uh, very fast cars, and if you look at the video, the, you have certain um, facts become very apparent. First of all, the human interaction is not central anymore so that the humans are subservient to kind of an autonomous AI that's doing its thing. All we need to do is like maybe deploy some troops there. The second thing, there's no imagination of like the, the socioeconomic impact of the technologies, the ecological footprint of the technologies. The third thing, which I think is more of a concern in, in kind of European context, is data privacy and, 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 and security of all these systems. Uh, what happens if you can hack into the system? And what happens to, in the previous slide, you see uh, a lot of faces being recognized and there's no one that is left out. It's so easy. It works so seemingly, seamlessly. So this really tells us that, hey, world building is actually being adopted, not as a creative practice, but, but as a practice in policy, in, in government building, in state building. And what this also shows us is that world building can also be a colonial practice is that nothing on this land, as you see in the city, is outside the reach of this autonomous AI in the sky, this omnipresent bird eye view uh, thing. But to delve deeper into what it means to, to have a colonial data practice, I uh, quote uh, Nick Caudry uh, from his paper in 2018 that um, data colonialism is actually an extractive process, is that you see there is data everywhere and we need to extract it, and it's synonymous with historical colonialism, and it, and it is based on the, on the, on the idea that we, if we can quantify something, we can control it. So basically everything that is livable, part of lived experience, we can quantify it, we can control it, we can turn it into data. And there is three factions to this colonialism. So he really tried to define it. it before that, it's been used kind of, you know, a, a, a spartically kind of like to describe a phenom phenomena we don't understand. So he tried to really understand what it means mm. to ha adopt this data colonialism paradigm. First of all, you think of data as something existent in nature, so something reminiscent. Just as we built railroads in nature to colonize it, as uh, it's something that we, we kind of had, it, were entitled to as humans, data is the same. Data is just out there, it's waiting to be harnessed. That's number one. <laughs> number two is that you have a legal structure to aid you in harnessing this data. So 
whenever you check a terms of ser a service, it really legitimizes this data colonialism uh, ideology. The third is actually quite new, and it's, it, it um, really um, focuses on the self, that you're also part, you're proactively aiding in this data colonialism because you're constantly sharing and you're constantly monitoring your own self. As you see, we have to be nodes of this whole ecology to make it work. And you're a proactive node in this data colonialism. And one thing, we, we talked about like kind of this capitalistic modes of production, a promise of this data colonialism is that no aspect of life is not quantifiable and thus no aspect of life is outside uh, production. So we see this with like glamour labor. People uh, uh, quantify and, and, and commodify their beauty, for example. Um, so, so every aspect of life, if it can t turn into data, this is the promise, of course, we can sell it in a market. And I think the underlying reality behind this, and I think something that we often miss to uh, uh, state, is that coloniality and data coloniality does not affect every in the same. We're not all victimized on the same way. If there's this kind of like unspoken of structure that is constantly harnessing our data, turning us into data points and trying to uh, quantify us, some people actually benefit from surveillance. Surveillance states, businessmen. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't affect all the subjects in the same way. And another thing that we um, often miss when we talk about this coloniality is that we think it's just a, a, a parallel. It's like, oh yeah, we're colonizing nature just like the Europeans maybe colonized the South. But actually, that's not the case. If you look at data, we talked about data, I think, in previous panels being spatial. There's cartographies of how data of technology moves. Data is also spacious, uh, spatial, and it follows uh, same patterns that happened before in like colonial histories. And um, it's important to talk about it in the same way as uh, Rolando Vasquez talked, talked about in his oppressive grammars of power. And one researcher that has really taken this to heart uh, is Andrew Graham from uh, the Oxford Inter uh, Internet Institute. And uh, he also uh, kind of took it to heart that, okay, data is spatial and we need to follow data around. And he did a project with Wikipedia. And you see in all the, the um, articles in Africa, for example, 97% um, of, uh, of the knowledge created for Africa came from Europe, from like this <laughs> tiny part of the world. So there is a, kind of a dominance in narrative, in even how data moves and how data is constructed. So I want to ask the question, what world does that build? So here is the data building process, a world building process, and what data does that build? So we're actually kind of lacking of a, of a um, framework to help us build data worlds that are effective for us. And there comes Saeed Ali in a, in a, in a paper called the, uh, uh, Decolonial Computing. And uh, he tried to propose kind of like a soft ideology of what should we do to make uh, decolonial systems that are data centered. And there's two options. First of all, he was like, all right, look at your positionality where are you positioned as a body, and try to start from there when you, whenever you're building like an AI system or a data sharing platform. The second is always embracing the decolonial options. Look at who's being oppressed. Look at uh, uh, local epistemologies and, and, and give the platform to these things. Mm -hmm. And this, this was, I, I think, a good position paper, a good uh, uh, guiding light. But then uh, there are researchers which, which took this further, and then they were like, okay, there are, there's world building as a process, but then there is world building with data, and that is different, and that needs to depart from two notions. The first is data liberation, is that data needs to liberate, not just control. And the second is data protection, is that your privacy as an individual, your autonomy as an individual, the in integrity of the data itself is also important. And um, this is quite, um, also based on, on what data can do, not what it represents. Uh, and this was done by a researcher at King's College, uh, Jonathan Gray. And he defined three aspects of this data world building. So we want to build a world with, with a data system that we are putting forward. First of all, you need to understand that uh, data is, is not just representing something. Data has a creative capacity to create something that does not exist. And we need to accept that. 
It's not, it, it, fabrication is, is often used as a bad word, but we're constantly fabricating and we need to come at peace with this. The second is that data is, is we're trying to build an ecology and data uh, uh, gets its power from other data points, so it needs to be a collective collaboration. Mm -hmm. Everyone should be building this data world. Mm -hmm. The third is that it's geographical again, so there needs to be like a transnational collaboration when it comes to building data. So a very basic example of the first uh, aspect, horizons of intelligibility. You have, uh, there's a lot of these funky experiments that people had where they would have a lot of data points about a uh, number of people drowning in a pool and the films Nicolas Cage, Nicolas Cage appeared in. And they forge uh, a, a correlation between both. So this is kind of a more humorous note. And then the second one, where uh, I think it, it was a teenager that made this, was they tried to have you spend Bill Gates' money. Um, obviously, this is all fictional, but just to show you the amount of wealth he has and you keep buying yachts and buildings and... <laughs> But still, nothing has happened. The second thing, collective accomplishments. I, th I think there's a lot of open uh, street maps uh, initiatives, things like in Egypt, there is an open harass map to track harassments where people mm -hmm. would annotate the data points and they build their own kind of data world. And I think we need to kind of really protect these, uh, these things because these are, it's a discourse that we know and we've all participated in building. The third, actually, transnational collaboration is the perfect time to talk about it now, because mm -hmm. this is a table we're all very fami familiar with. This is the table of cases in COVID. <laughs> and every row in this table is a country, and every country has its own uh, data practices, its mm. own reporting practices, its own story, and somehow we have to collaborate together. I don't know how well we did it as, as, as you know, <laughs> a global population, but we had to do this to paint an image into what this virus is. And there was no other way. So this was actually a necessary world, world building process that we were all part of and we all witnessed. So that's kind of a, um, a framework that kind of tries to help us break away from this innovation uh, revision uh, dichotomy. Because constantly, we put something out into the market and we go like, oh crap, <laughs> this, this has ruined some stuff. Let's go back and revise it. So we need to put work out there that is conscious of what it's going to do. And this was kind of what was trying to be formalized in the critical speculative design uh, as presented by Johansson. And I think a lot of people have talked about this, but it's kind of embedding yourself outside of uh, um, a traditional desi design, trying to be disruptive and thinking about what's going to happen, what are the social relationships that are going to uh, happen because of, of my technology. But again, I asked, is this also inherently decolonial? We look at exhibit B of future scenarios presented by Microsoft this time, and this is a vision of Microsoft Surface. So you can see all the surfaces are interacting harmoniously. There's different applications in retail. There's different applications uh, at work. Uh, teleconferencing has evolved. Everything is seamless. There's no latency issues, which I find you know, quite uh, questionable. But then you notice one thing. And I think this is uh, from a paper done on the discourse of uh, critical uh, design, speculative critical design, is that the visual discourse is often full, uh, devoid of people of color. And it always presents uh, a world that is perfectly squared, clean surfaces, also the absence of renewable technology, ecological footprint. Most uh, couples in these scenarios are often heterosexual. There's no poverty. There's no relationships between the wealthy and the poor. There's no relationship between the col colonialized and the colonialist. Uh, there's no queer presence. There's no trans presence. The visual discourse is, is really kind of just clean. It's often as they, they wiped off whatever we have now, and they built a new future. And I think that's quite toxic, and it, we go back into this whole dichotomy of revision uh, innovation. So I think what I, what in my last few minutes, I think I have two or three. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, um, I, um, I want to show basically some examples of what we need to do to build, kind of to embrace the decolonial option, as Said Ali said. So first of all, we need to adopt new languages of power. Uh, something like solar punk, for example, is super important because it came uh, post to cyberpunk. 
uh, as, as a visual language. Solar punk envisions a world that is technologically advanced, so it's good. We don't have to shift away from technology, but there's a presence of green spaces and renewable energy. There is also uh, a book called The Intersectional Internet, which centers the, the um, uh, experiences of, of black, uh, queer, people of color, uh, feminist uh, uh, histories of the web. And it's important to understand that the internet and data practices have a legacy that is not just uh, military based or that's not just Silicon Valley based. Uh, the second thing is, is really de decolonizing the data source because, okay, it's good we, we've de we embrace the decolonial option. It's good we, we have a new language. But when it comes to building, uh, for example, like AI models, we have the garbage in, garbage out principle. Whatever garbage you feed it, the <laughs> same garbage is gonna come out. So if you feed it uh, a kind of like a sexist, male-centered data set, that's what's gonna come out in the end. So the, uh, Caroline Sinders has, has uh, done tremendous work in uh, collecting these uh, kind of feminist data sets as collaborative practices, that's on the right. On the left is a project that I've been uh, involved in, is, um, and we tried to build a, a chatbot uh, that uh, identifies harassment and then uh, counters harassers on its own. And we found a lot of obstacles, as in most of the data sets that had uh, lexicons of harassment were really outdated. So a word like the N-word, for example, a lot of the time it's, it's been reappropriated and it's used endearingly, but a lot of uh, uh, um, AIs would flag it as, as inappropriate or violent. And, and it's, it's really the data set is a mess. So we need to really decolonize these conversations and these data sets. The second is, is methodology. Mm. I think we have to be very creative in the methodology. Uh, I think a lot of uh, the future of tech is not just about computer science, it's not just about the technicality, it's about understanding the relationships that sh shape around it. So I've, I've done two projects. In the first project, I used um, the Chicago School uh, um, uh, urban um, theories to map conversations that happen online. So I, I mapped conversations on Twitter and I was like, who's at the center, who's on the periphery? The second, uh, I tried to analyze irony online, which is, which is something that is very difficult to study, but we used Lefebvre's rhythm analysis. So we turned uh, um, Facebook posts into music and we saw the disruptions in the rhythm and we were like, we tried to make uh, uh, conclusions. A lot of these were very experimental, but we really had a lot of insight about what we need to do to understand things that are usually taken for granted. Um, so yeah, I think what I now want to end with is, is, is that we really need to think about who's building the world and who we're building the world for. Just to, to embrace speculative design or to embrace world building as an exit. Like this, this type of solutionism is something that we really need to abolish and we need to, we need to constantly think and rethink and experiment. I don't think we have a crisis of imagine, imagination. We have a crisis of positionality. Mm. Where are we in this imagination and who is presenting or who's constructing and who's taking control of that future? And uh, yeah. That's, uh, that's it, and I think here's a very quick summary of what I said, so thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> Great, I wanna, uh, I have uh, so much to say, but uh, I, I wanna kick it off by saying that, um, well, I really appreciated uh, your comments very much, and um, I think I wanna pick on one, one thing that you said, that you said um, to get beyond the things, you know, they. These technologies did emerge, let's face it, from military technologies. Yes. And so um, how do we kind of, get, you spoke of getting beyond that. Um, and I think that's kind of an interesting problem to face because it's something that we're maybe only subliminally aware of anymore. You know that it started with uh, ARPANET, that GPS yeah. came from DARPA as well, all these things. Um, now we use these to make artworks and send funny cat, yeah, cat yeah. emojis yeah. and whatever, and yeah. it's kind of completely separate from that. Is but is there some value though in keeping that kind of keeping that in the forefront of memory that we we cannot escape though that this is this is in large part where these things come from and we have to transform them somehow, or is it better to leave it, forget it, and accept leave that, that history and, that and accept that we've we're changing it into something else. Um, I think it's a good question. I think it's a really good question because there is a, with, with web historians, there's a big debate of what actually is the internet. So if we say the military 
constructed the internet or constructing the cyberspace? Is it only the um, the infrastructure behind it, the physical infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Is it the protocols that have later come in based on practice? Or is it the way that people use it because the internet is constantly evolving based on the way it is used? Mm -hmm. and, and protocols are constantly changing to accommodate for the usage. So actually, I think to say that, okay, the military created the internet is um, a reduction. Mm. Is, is a very violent reduction. I think they set up, maybe, they, they put the seed, and they had a completely different intention for it. And I could imagine, for, ex for example, a big part of the way we use the internet now is, and a lot of theorists like Arya Dean wrote about this, um, is due to, let's say, black entertainers, like African-American entertainers, how, how they use certain platforms, or how they circulate memes, for example, is, is a big part of the evolution of, of, of the web. And there are a lot of different snippets where you see people have shaped the internet with the way they used it, and they've added to the infrastructure of, of the web somehow. It is a constantly evolving, living, thing. <laughs> I think it's an ecology on its own. Mm. So it's kind of, you're, you're saying, all right, there's a big bang that created the internet and the military made it. And I think it's a violent reduction. And I think what we should start with is really acknowledging, uh, acknowledging these alternative stories. Yeah, viewing it as a living organism, I think, yeah. is a useful uh, metaphor. And also, as you were speaking, I was thinking of it kind of, you know, how rocks become shaped by the water that's yes. dripped for years on it. And it's kind of like, okay, the rock was there, it, but it's been shaped over years of use and different uh, forces. Yeah, Absolutely. And yeah. I think with the Internet is that we have to know that there are multiple histories of the Internet. Mm -hmm. I think every country had its own timeline. Uh, there, there is not one. Of course, yeah. I think it's, it's quite lazy and it's quite convenient to go like all right here here's how it started yeah military pl protocol you know yeah no i think i was approaching it more from like the that we should maybe uh be more critical therefore of it you know it's kind of as a as a not mm -hmm. uh, not as giving them undue credit but more kind of um so how is it poisoned how is it a poison yeah. chalice uh but uh, you know anyways it could be viewed from either yeah. either angle of course um so maybe uh if i can just get you to comment a little further on one other thing that you you raised which i think is really powerful is the idea of new languages of power so yes. um this is something that's i think really complicated and uh it's complicated to enact let's say i mean we can we can talk about how we implement new languages of power but uh, practically, how do you think that might uh, unfold? Or how could we do better at um, having that catch on, these new languages of power? Yeah. You talked about reclaiming words as well yeah, in, the, yeah. in, the, in the chatbot scenario. So I thought that was kind of interesting as well. Yeah, I think it's, it's from one part, it's about changing the way we talk about certain things. Um, I think in the uh, Cy Cyborg Manif Manifesto, Donna Haraway really talks about this a lot. It's like we need to, to um, adopt new languages to talk about our relationship with gender, with technology. Um, and I really, I, I, part of the work that I do is poetry. And I really believe that we, we have a poetic license to talk about things in a different way. And I think one example is... Um, I was part of um, the IM conference in Barcelona, and uh, they had adopted in the beginning that um, you don't say climate change, you say environmental emergency. Hmm. And that really changes the way everything happens. Mm -hmm. That really changes the way. So also trying to rethink of the web uh, as a living organism, for example, or as an ecology, mm -hmm. that we as users are part of the ecology, but also governments are part of the ecology, internet service providers are part of the ecology, the workers working in, in, in data centers are part of the ecology, and, and really thinking when, you, when you're speaking, am I leaving anyone out? Am I, am I leaving anyone's interest out? Unless it's deliberate, of course, <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's, you have to constantly question and adopt new words. I mean, I, I have not personally done enough, I think, uh, uh, to create a new language, but I, I, I think it's something that, that should be the next step. It's, it's po probably maybe also just, a, you know, you just have to practice it. It's a, yeah. It has to become a, a, a sort of constant practice where, yeah, instead of saying climate change, saying environmental emergency is something that it's not rolling off my tongue yet, but I, I no. can work on it. You yeah, know? yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do we have any questions from the audience or from social media or shall we, uh, 
shall we move move on and well, the, let the, the aspect of um, climate change and uh, climate destruction or uh, climate emergency there are many ver variations going on there huh? and uh, the interesting thing to me is that when how does a certain frame word become more dominant yeah. yeah because you can you, you can use the word once but that won't be enough eh? you have to use it and repeat it and certain people have to repeat it and and say <laughs> say it if p people have a certain power uh, position um so that's that's i think an interesting question is how you, how do you infuse certain fra new frames and new words into the public uh, discourse yeah that it becomes um it it it, it can compete with the, the dominant frame we are used in this case, climate yeah. change. Or yeah. Uh, you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I, I, I can bring it back to how words proliferate online, because <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that has really been my research. And I think you, you said, of course, there is power given to certain words. There are discourses that champion certain uh, names over other names. And I think part of this equation is now is that AI, Google, for example, determines uh, a lot of the time, which keywords make it, which which uh, which things make it, and a lot of the time, it's not a person deciding, but the way a program is coded. So if something has enough, and that's how this information spreads, if something has enough sensationalism behind it, but it's not maybe meaningful or disruptive, it will make it far. Mm. So mm. all these like cartographies of knowledge online, we we have to do. I, I think it's it's all an ecosystem. So you have you're trying to put out a wor word, but for it to work out, there's a system that is taking it down. There are people that mm -hmm. are, are taking it down. So I think we really need to think. Uh, um, yeah, the systems that we think are objective, like uh, an indexing system or or, or a social media system. So mm. all our feeds are curated. Mm. All the information, almost all the information that I consume in my day, are curated by something, and I don't know so much about that curation process. So it's, it's, I think part of it is making what's invisible v visible. It's, it's, it's yeah. uh, unboxing mm. or, or, or taking, breaking mm. open the black box. Mm. Mm. Right. Yeah, questioning objectivity. Yes. Yeah, very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Well, I think now we should transition to uh, Ruben Jacobs, who is going to give yeah. our next uh, talk. You're next up on the spaceship. Are you going to yeah, switch places? Yeah. <laughs> right. And Ruben is currently writing a book about degrowth. And I think that's what you're going to talk about a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not that I write a book about degrowth, but it has a very important, it's a very important component of the book. Of the book, so all right. All right. It's not entirely about degrowth. Entirely, degrowth. all right, yeah. But you're going <coughs> to tell us more, I'm sure. So, yeah, sure. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, so, so welcome. Yeah, as you as you said, uh, I'm working on the on a book about degrowth. It's actually a book about uh, the ecological civilization or ecological mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. Is is to sketch the contours of of what people in, in several domains are working on, and um, it, it is actually um, I build it up the book in three chapters, three main parts, and the, the first part is actually the the, the system level. And, and the second part is the world view level. And then when you go deeper, you, you come into the domain of myths and metaphors. It's, it's, it's kind of a way of looking at how does uh, structural long-term changes of civilizations occur mm. and on what, what kind of levels. And, and I guess the, the degrowth um, discussion uh, occurs mainly on the first level, the, the system and the patterns of how the world we uh, are familiar with has been evolving and what are the underlying structures. And of course, one of the main, maybe the main structure is that we are uh, living in a growth-oriented uh, society, a growth-oriented economy. Um, some call it capitalism, but I think the main, the main, yeah, the main um, structure dynamic is that it is, 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 is constantly expanding. And Degrowth uh, as a word, as a movement, as a uh, idea, it tries to kind of um, yeah, question this, this central idea of, of capitalist society by, yeah, uh, by using a, uh, um, um, yeah, the opposite of, of growth, huh? in, this, in, this, in this case, degrowth. So it's a kind of a subversive utopia, in, in a sense, and um, 
um, when I first encountered the words, uh, yeah, it, 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 it took my interest and uh, it never left me in that sense. Um, so before I start my story, I wanted to say, uh, I wanted to show you uh, a short um, yeah, fragment of a speech by, maybe it's already on the, like this. It's a speech of Robert Kennedy, the younger brother of uh, JFK, who I think eight years after he was murdered uh, was also um, trying to become president of the United States. <laughs> and uh, he was a nominee. And, um, and then, as many probably know, he was also killed during that uh, campaign um, period. Uh, very tragic, of course. And um, a few years ago, I think maybe 10 years ago or a bit longer, uh, some found a part of a speech of his first campaign speech at the Kansas University, State University, um, in which he, in that period, of course, there was a lot about civil rights, Vietnam, um, but there was also a smart, yeah, a short uh, part in his speech where he said something about GDP. And this, was, this short part eventually uh, inspired a whole generation of thinkers about how could we get um, passed by this very dominant focus on GDP uh, growth as a measure of how our economy um, yeah, functions. And uh, I was just, yeah, uh, let's just uh, listen to it. It's, uh, I think, in one minute, and um, I think, in, in a way, he kind of uh, summarizes the whole uh, main um, strife focus of the degrowth uh, movement. Remind Although us this whole word was, wasn't existing yet, eh? so it yeah. was just... Uh, what year was this? Sorry, this is, I uh, 1968. 68, oh, right. yeah. Okay. Too much and for too long, we seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community value in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product now is over $800 billion a year. But that gross national product, if we judge the United States of America by that, that gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwood and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl. It counts napalm and it counts nuclear warheads and armored cars for the police to fight the riots in our city. It counts Whitman's rifles and Specs knives and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry, or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And it can tell us everything about America, except why we are proud that we are Americans. Yeah. Of wow. Course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, still very powerful words. Um, uh, of course, it's, it's a campaign. It's <laughs> patriotistic. Uh, <laughs> but in general, he does... I think very uh, eloquently expresses what is wrong with such a focus on the GDP as the sole measure, measure of how we measure the success of our societies. And um, a few years later, um, we all know this report, uh, um, yeah, this report uh, came out, Limits of Growth by the Club of Rome, and um, which was, yeah, I guess the, the first very uh, thorough um, um, by computers 
uh, measured um, uh, yeah, uh, scenarios of how our worldwide economy would develop if we would continue in this growth-oriented um, economy. And um, in that same year, a French philosopher, Andrew uh, Gortz, um, said in a um, conference the following, is the earth balance for which no growth or even degrowth of material production is necessary conditioning compatible with the survival of the capitalist system? And this was, as some say, as historians say, the first moment the, the word degrowth mm -hmm. was mentioned. And, um, and at the same time also raised the question in, in, a, in a sense, does degrowth mean eventually the end of capitalism? Is it or is it possible to find a capitalist system which could uh, be um, surviving without growth? That's a uh, it's a good question. Uh, that's not the question I want to focus on at this mm. moment. But it's inter interesting to see that. Uh, let me see that uh, from that period, from the 70s on, you you see the development of what they call the ecological economics. Mm. So the ecological fields. Many disciplines are being integrated in economic thinking. Uh, you see all these kinds of uh, images, um, and I think uh, the main element of these images is that these ecological economic uh, economic uh, economists try to kind of embed the economy in the larger biosphere, so that they see the economy as a subsystem of the biosphere. And um, that it, it's, it uses raw materials, it uh, has wastes, and uses solar energy or other uh, types of energy, and that also um, uh, delivers heat, uh, which yeah comes into the biosphere, and we all know what uh, <laughs> what that means. And um, uh, probably for most of us, uh, these stories are not that new. Uh, we we do know that there are limits to growth, uh, not only um, to um, concern to climate change, but also if you look at other problems like biodiversity, um, the, all the material footprint of the worldwide economy um, is contains not only like fossil fuels, but also uh, biomass, non-metallic min minerals, all these um, materials combined together um, uh, make up the size of the economy and, and, and its footprint on the uh, largest system biosphere. And uh, the main point of degrowth thinkers um, is that uh, this idea of GDP, um, actually from, from out of the 70s already, starts um, um, diverse, diversing from what they call the GPI, like just general progress indicators, like our human well-being, uh, ecological degradation, like the ecological um, healthiness of our environments. And, and if you look at these kinds of uh, figures, you see that that our growth doesn't really uh, account, uh, doesn't, till the 70, is, it has a positive impact on our general well-being. And from then on, you see that this uh, actually doesn't really um, uh, go on, goes on anymore, and it actually is diversing much mm -hmm. more. And um, so, the main idea about degrowth, as I understood it, is um, as I use a quote of Jason Hickel, one of the main thinkers in that um, in that uh, area, is that degrowth is twofold. So it's on one hand, it's about economic contraction. It's about slowing down the economic production of our globalist society, global economy, and at the same time reducing inequality and improving human well-being. Um, I think that's a really important aspect of the degrowth thinking is that because before you start discussing it, the main critique will be that, yeah, like, um, Shrinking your economy means uh, a lot of uh, despair and uh, pain for many people. And that is the case definitely in a growth-oriented economy because a crisis like we are in at this moment, a recession, 
um, that's not a nice thing. It, 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 it will deliver a lot of pain, and especially on uh, 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 to people who are not on the top of the, uh, of the mountain, so to say. So the main idea about degrowth thinkers is that they want to combine this idea of economic contraction with, at the same time, distributing socioeconomic um, uh, outputs. And um, this very uh, worthwhile read uh, of, of a couple of years ago by uh, Howard Odom and his uh, wife, Elizabeth, uh, both like system thinkers, ecologists, they wrote this book called The Prosper uh, Pros Prosperous Way Down, which <laughs> I find is a really beautiful uh, <laughs> title. Uh, um, and um, is that uh, what they say here is like it's, a, it's like a giant train. The world economy is slowly cresting its trip up the mountain of growth and there comes a moment that it has to go down. And uh, the, the question is, of course, how does it go down? And, 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 and our challenge is to go down on a very, uh, yeah, uh, as nice as possible way, uh, a prosperous way in that sense. So uh, it's a bit counterintuitive, uh, but I think that's, that's similar to the degrowth thinking, is that it's on the one hand, it's very subversive, and, it's, um, and then on the other hand, tries to, to paint a utopian kind of vision on what is else possible uh, if we think uh, uh, yeah, uh, further than the growth-oriented e economy. Um, if you look at books which have been published recently, you see that this idea of uh, getting to a, to a top level, a plateau, and that, that this, this plateau is actually maybe meant to go, meant to become a plateau and not something which goes on forever, uh, infinite growth, is, is the, these two books. Um, one is fully grown, why a stagnant economy is a sign of success, which is a, actually kind of a nice frame, um, is that, yeah, it, it is actually a matter maybe of, uh, in that sense, uh, comparable with a human being, that a human <laughs> being grows and there's a certain moment that the human being is, is just, he stops growing. Uh, you are an adult, so to say, or at least you don't uh, get any taller anymore. Um, and um, a similar book, which is in that same kind of category, is a book uh, by Catherine Trebek and Jeremy Williams. It's called The Economics of Arrival, in which they also try to kind of frame it as something, as the idea is that maybe there is a moment we have arrived to a certain uh, level of wealth, especially, of course, uh, in... in uh, um, uh, high uh, high income countries in, in mainly in the West, of course, is that uh, uh, we have to kind of find um, a way of feeling comfortable with that kind of uh, arrival, and have to kind of maybe shift our focus on what is actually something to strive from that point on, than only more wealth accumulation, capital accumulation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you see also that in the main public discourse that at least growth as be, is, is being uh, discussed and being um, criticized much more um, in the last decade. Uh, you can see it in uh, pop popular uh, media outlets like the New York Times, Vice, even the OECD, like the Economic uh, Board of the Rich economies in, 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 in the world. They even published a, a book called Beyond Growth, um, which in which they're very careful of really wanting to go beyond growth. Uh, but yeah, it's not a, not a small thing that, that even these institutions are becoming to, yeah, aware of that this, this growth-oriented economy is maybe not that uh, feasible anymore. And even there are also, also some practical um, um, examples of, in this case, New Zealand, which already adopted a well-being budget, uh, in which they also decided not to strive solely uh, for economic growth, but to kind of orient the economy around several um, indicators, mm. uh, like human well-being, ecological well-being, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and even the general public, this is the only Dutch 
article I could find, but uh, I, I would translate it for you, is that uh, a recent uh, um, um, research um, uh, showed that 80% of the Netherlands uh, do want to, of course, a recovery of the economy after the corona crisis, but they um, do think that well-being, general well-being, has to be uh, prioritized before economic uh, growth. So. Um, uh, that's an interesting uh, insight that the general public is also not that even, uh, um, uh, how do you say, uh, it is quite yeah, positive of maybe thinking about it, a, a post-growth uh, oriented economy. And you could say that as these uh, two or three main degrowth thinkers say that yeah, degrowth in, this, in essence is not finally about less of the same, because that's the main, that's the first reaction of m many people have, like degrowth just means less of all the same we have now. And that's something they want to get past, like degrowth is, is in, as they say here, is, in, uh, is not an affirmative imaginary, it, it sig signifies the, uh, the opposite of growth, it, it's, uh, it's an imaginary that uh, by confronting growth, it opens up new imaginaries, new spaces, new words to think about. And that's also my experience with degrowth. It, uh, my first encountering also did um, um, give me a kind of uh, male function. How you get? Uh, how, how would you express it? Uh, 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 hard to kind of imagining something beyond beyond a growth economy but uh, at the same time it does it did really uh, trigger me about thinking about okay but how could it look like because uh, it, it really challenged me to kind of um, put a lot of energy in trying to imagine what degrowth could mean if you are so used to thinking about a growth oriented, that growth is naturally and growth is progress and that's the only way forward is growth. Huh? And I think that's the main, um, okay, this is a bit, normally this slide evolves during the presentation. Now it's already there, all, all, uh, all there on the slide. Um, so you don't see all of it, unfortunately. But I try to actually uh, sketch the degrowth, post-growth community because it's not a, a homogeneous mm -hmm. community. There are several yeah, sub-groups. Um, there are several strategies on how would we be getting to this kind of degrowth scenario. And um, unfortunately, you can't see it on the left, but uh, it is normally divided in what you could call the reformists and the revolutionaries. So the reformers actually try to get to this well-being oriented, this post-growth oriented economy by going through the institutions we have at the moment, through normal politics. Uh, they all have ideas about a bond on GDP, um, scale down the economic production by Le legislating right to repair or abandoning the uh, plant obsolescence uh, um, ideas in, in general production uh, and also re redistributing uh, labor, expanding universal goods. All these kind of policy ideas are circulating in these in these uh, in milieus. And then on the other hand, you, you could say you have people who actually think more radical and they actually really want to. Um, leave behind the capitalist system. And in, in this camp, you also have a division between what you could say on the, on, on, on the one hand, the eco-socialists, which are more in favor of top-down uh, initiatives to restructure the economy and the society, and the more bottom-up eco-anarchist kind of uh, camps. And of course, this is a archetype kind of uh, way of Putting it, there are lo lots of overlaps between these groups. Um, but I had to think about it because uh, I once read the story about the civil rights movement in the 60s about Martin Luther King uh, versus, or, and um, 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 I just forgot his name, uh, Malcolm X, is that um, uh, a sociologist researched the effects of Malcolm X had on uh, the general 
uh, actions of Martin Luther King is that Martin Luther King, when he came up, uh, for many people, especially in the South, many white people, he was quite radical. But then after a few years, Malcolm X came on the, on the podium. And Malcolm X was, of course, loads of more radical than, than Martin Luther King. And the effect was that Martin Luther King became more acceptable for many people. And that's what they call the radical flank effect, is that, that these groups, um, which in general do have the same kind of objectives, but has, have different ideas about strategies and, and the ways of getting there, and how far, how far it has to go, is that uh, they have, that, that the degrowth uh, community, in my opinion, or my view, has that effect on the general more donut economy, uh, well-being economy ideas, which are more acceptable for the mainstream thinking. And they pool, the, or that would be, or perf in, in the perfect world would be the, the effect that they pool it all um, down their um, um, area. So, yeah, I think it's a very general overview of the community but, and, and the different strategies uh, behind that. And of course, there are many sub milieus and all kinds of uh, uh, yeah, uh, variations on, on what I've shown here. So let me go a bit further. So um, before I get to the end, um, I think uh, what uh, the question here was, of course, also what would be the effects of the degrowth thinking on, or in general on like design principles or principles of yeah, getting to work? What, what, is, what is their agenda? And, and it's actually hard to, that one of the, 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 the weakness of the, of the movement is that they don't have a very uh, clear overview program, a blueprint of where does this all has to go. At the same time, it's also a strength. Uh, but you could say that there are a few uh, general principles which you see in many ways occurring uh, all around. So on one hand, it's, it's about rest restoration. It's about decolonization. It's about uh, restoration of the natural world uh, or, or our relationship to the natural world. You see it in the language uh, about re rewilding, re reusing, recycling, regenerative. Um, and so th that's, that's, I think, one, one uh, important element of, of the, the underlying degrowth um, worldview, so to say. And another one is, and that's more directly um, re related to design in, in, in a general uh, way, it is that it tries to put source materials on the front and not in the back. So in, in, in this particular uh, case, um, designers think about how could we, we don't think about what we want to make, we first think what is available materially what can we use? And from then, we think about what can we design with it. Um, but the, 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 yeah, I think the, the, the main focus on source materials, or at least try to kind of um, sh get in, in view the things which were not that well uh, somewhere in the background and, and put it in the forefront. Another one, I think uh, what you also see uh, that many degrowth thinkers are in some or another way uh, promoting is, is relocalization of production, but also relationships. Uh, this is actually an example of a press, what they call the Preston model. It's a, it's a city in, uh, in the UK, it, which had lots of problems after the financial crisis and tried to reorganize their local eco economy by uh, organizing uh, and, and inventing all kinds of co-ops and uh, publicly owned companies. And uh, what they have been succeeding is that they have really relocalized many aspects of the economy um, and make them much more uh, resilient uh, to crisis in the future and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, I think one of those other uh, principles is is that yeah, working with nature or 
having a relationship with nature or improving the relationship or the, the what they call convivial way of living with the natural world, but also being inspired by the natural world is something which uh, many degrowth thinkers uh, aspire in, in, in a way. And I think it's, it's a way also which could be a principle for design in general, in general ways. Um, a last one is, um, yeah, is, is sharing in general, sharing all kinds of economic activities, but also combining those with uh, or, or attaching them to social activity. This is an uh, like experimental idea about uh, washing machines. Uh, washing machines are, as we know, uh, use a lot of energy and water. And um, what would happen if you relocate washing machines in a public square where people can at the same time have a social um, connection instead? In general, it's, it's, a, it's a bit like going back to a certain way of doing in the past. And I think that's also a, a, um, a kind of move which the degrowthers do a lot is that they, they don't want to go back to the past, but they want to bring the past back into the future, certain, certain elements of the past. And um, I think we all, uh, you said something about it as well, is that, um, and that especially accounts with the degrowth thinking, is that it's, um, before you know you, you, you come into the, the dichotomy of back to the Shire Lord of the Rings <laughs> world, or you go to the Mordor industrial capitalist world. And I think uh, eventually we have to come somewhere um, yeah, somewhere in between and uh, in a more hybrid world, which um, doesn't really shy away, of course, of modern technology and stuff. And I think many degrowths don't actually do that. In that sense, uh, the solar punk you already said something about, uh, which, uh, yeah, this picture you could account to as well, uh, does try to kind of, um, has a lot of similarities with the degrowth thinking as well. As, as a utopia which kind of breaks out of the, 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 the apocalyptic uh, dominant way of looking at the future without not trying to be that naive as well. Um, so, you know, I wanted to throw something your way that uh, it's a kind of a cliche that we hear in the, in the news sometimes, but, you know, privatize the profits and socialize the losses. And uh, this is something that uh, comes up when, of course, you know, uh, you mentioned the Preston model in the UK. Um, you know, they sold the national rail, you know, and of course it's uh, losing tons of money because it's very difficult actually to run a national rail infrastructure. Yeah. Um, but, you know, th they always seem to walk away and just uh, it kind of gets sold on to the next, uh, the next uh, victim, you could call them, I don't know, <laughs> these hapless companies that don't know what they're doing actually running uh, a business. And, uh, but the losses end up eaten by the taxpayer. We see it again with bailouts that occur yeah. time and again. Yeah. Yeah. How do we avoid degrowth being about more of the same kind of, um, the, the guys on the bottom pay the price, the people who yeah. are who are the yeah. most vulnerable pay the yeah. price for uh, the, the pain that, yeah. that we might feel from degrowth. Yeah. What, what, what's your vision, I guess, for an equitable degrowth yeah. model? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Uh, I think that's one of the main uh, challenges mm. of the degrowth thinking, uh, uh, I guess, uh, because that's that's a that's a real real danger, of course. That 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 that's uh, eventually it boils down eventually uh, to yeah, eventually into politics as well, and then and and the um, the, the 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 ideas behind the politics. Um, what I've understood from the degrowth is that they th their plan is that. Uh, there must be a fair distribution, redistribution of um, income, of uh, but also of uh, labor in general. So, uh, if you, for example, one one of their ideas is to scale down certain economic activity, which we have to scale down eventually, anyway. But uh, but then rapidly, and then the question is, of course, that that will take that will mean a, a lot of loss of jobs for many people. Definitely in the bottom, mm. mostly of the time, if you think about fossil fuel industry and that, that kind of stuff. And, and one, of the, one of those ideas they have is that they uh, are opting for what they call a shorter work week or a general job guarantee, is that if you could combine that uh, reduction 
contraction of these industries with um, uh, shorter work week in which many more people can have jobs, but shorter jobs with a guarantee that they have a general income, which makes them possible of doing, buying the general needs they, they need. Um, so I think that that's the main strategy they have. Of course, yeah, there are many opposite uh, powers. And the question is, of course, what will it eventually boil down if you go into that political process and you fight for those um, policies that, um, yeah, as we know, policy of, of yeah is, is is eventually always a compromise in a sense. So that 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 is definitely a, a challenge. Um, yeah, and uh, maybe also another quick thing about uh, GDP, which I think is kind of an interesting. Yeah. I, I loved that quote from Robert Kennedy. That was really yeah. uh, nice to, yeah. uh, kind of shocking actually, uh, kind of to hear that. Um, um, even then, of course, it was it was arising the this knowledge and uh, well, it's also amazing to hear American politicians talking like that yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> at all. Um, but uh, amazing to to think of that then seeing really that what it doesn't measure, you know, what GDP yeah. fails yeah. to account for, and that's something also that was taken up by uh, feminist economists like Marilyn Waring in 1988, who wrote. Uh, uh, what was the book called? Um, if Women Counted. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. by not counting care work that's yeah. unpaid, by not counting uh, all the volunteer work that makes basically even rich societies thrive. I mean, yeah. ask any uh, ask any parent uh, how many hours the the other parents donate to the to the primary school, for example. Um, this just kind of keeps things things flowing. Yeah. Um, so maybe I can, can actually connect your two your two talks here, and maybe you can both. Uh, question or comment on this idea of value and shifting values, how we can, I mean, she wrote that in 1988, so, you know, and Robert Kennedy gave this talk in 1968, so yeah. how far are we in 2020? It doesn't yeah. seem that far, actually. So what can we do to kind of push push this conversation about value and valuing things that are uh, not necessarily uh, accountable in dollars and cents, uh, or euros and cents, sorry. Uh, yep. I betray my origins. <laughs> uh, how can we kind of push that a little bit further forward. Either one of you are welcome to jump in. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll need to think a second yeah. about <laughs> it. But, uh, well, well it, it, on the one hand, it, it's already happening. It's so already happening. you can clearly see that definitely because of the pandemic. Um, uh, the interesting thing is that in the, in the, in the beginning, I thought this is, gonna be, this is gonna be bad for the degrowth thinking because we're gonna be in a recession. Mm. And when you're in a recession, you wanna grow the economy again to get out of the recession. That's the n normal story we have already mm. for many decades. Um, on the other hand, you do see now, and it surprised me a bit, that uh, many people are, are questioning if that same trick is something we should mm -hmm. do again. And uh, mainly because, of course, the ecological problems have become much more feasible yeah and visible than in the eight, end, end of the 60s when Kennedy did this uh, speech. Uh, uh, it, it, yeah, it's really hard to kind of escape it anymore. Um, and on the other hand, we have also seen that, that like crucial jobs, as they say in the Netherlands, we have the word for it, it's like uh, vital jobs or something vital during the pandemic, oh, like yes, the, yeah. uh, mm. education, uh, yeah. teachers, uh, healthcare, uh, these sectors have been having a lot of troubles the last couple of decades with privatization, cuts, budget cuts, that kind of stuff. And now you see that how important these, these like vital jobs are. And many people have been convinced about it as well, and especially in the Netherlands, and I think it, it, it counts for many like European other countries as well, that uh, we now have been investing, we are now investing in them, and we see that uh, yeah, when we are in these kinds of situations, these are the, the, the jobs and the, the kind of work which is very vital. And especially yeah. also about care, uh, caring, uh, daycare and stuff, is that uh, I have a kid of two years old, and we had to be there with him for two months on uh, oh, a yeah. 24 hour and <laughs> we all experienced uh, how intensive that is and how important it is that we have daycares and stuff and that it's yeah actually very important that it's uh, something which is affordable for all yeah. of us so so i think 
Um, we are in a, a very uh, interesting uh, moment in time, and, and of course we have to take use of it, in a mm -hmm. sense, to try to push it, which were, was yeah. already under, underneath the surface for a long time, mm -hmm. to make it more feasible and, and to present the, the alternatives, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point that uh, uh, COVID has really uh, highlighted who is actually essential. Uh, it's, yeah. it's very interesting. It's, yeah. not, it's not the CEO. It's the, yeah. it's the, the guy delivering yeah. the food to the grocery store and, <laughs> and all of these other, yeah. and the people taking care of our yeah. children and that, that sort of thing. Um, so it, it would be nice if this, if this effect could last. You know, of course, we want to get post-pandemic as soon as possible, but yeah. if we can extend, though, this uh, kind of elevation of status, if, if you could call it that, yeah. that uh, people have been able to uh, obtain for these yeah. truly essential professions, that would be that would be a real achievement, actually, yeah. out of this uh, pandemic. I, I would say. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's also like experience experiencing something. It, it, it is always always quite a very very powerful mm -hmm. element of mm -hmm. change. That yeah. of course there are already ideas, and we have been talking about it for for decades already. Like it's de it's developed. These ideas are developed and and um, um, grown uh, in a sense. And and but then people really experience something, and then these ideas become more than an idea. They become more reality in a sense. And of course, there will also be powers which try to go back yeah. to what we have uh, uh, had in the past. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's our task yeah. as, as human beings, as, as civil, uh, civilians and stuff, uh, to try to push it and try to get these discussions going. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps, I mean, on the scale of, of we, we've been talking about time and, and looking at time differently over the course of the, this day and a half. And, uh, you know, so maybe I am being a little impatient saying, <laughs> okay, she wrote that in 1988. How come we're not <laughs> counting this already? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. things, we have to repeat things in order to understand them better and, and hear them multiple yeah. times, just like what we were saying earlier about language. We have to repeat the language yeah. that's more effective so that yeah. it, it sticks and that we can... It's not just words that we say, but that it gets deeper, that we understand what we're saying, yeah. actually, yeah. perhaps as well. But I, I think I also want to peg the question a little bit. There is a slide that you kind of skimmed over, which uh, had to do with, like, this, is degrowth compatible with the survival of capitalism? Yeah. And I think if we talk about value and value of certain things, we have to really talk about capitalist modes of production. Yeah. Yeah. What is, when is something deemed valuable? Because, because of the, exactly what I talked about, the quantification of everything, nothing is outside of this. Everything can be assigned value. Attention has been assigned value where it wasn't before. Uh, you have things, but for a lot of people also, let's say this, this shifting cartography or map of value has been helpful for some people. For example, a lot of people have been able to uh, uh, give value to the way they express their sexuality, for example, or they express certain things that weren't seen. There's a, the platform of like OnlyFans. It, it, it helps people kind of survive in a capitalist mode of production by the shifting geography of value. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I wonder, maybe I think I want to put it forward, is there another way to assign value that is, is, is not in this, in this mode of production? Is, is there another way to celebrate it also? Because yep. okay, we can say this is valuable, but then yep. how, do we, how do we celebrate Maybe it? Maybe there needs to be a credit meaningful? system for like contributing <laughs> to, the, to the wellness index. You talked about this. I, I actually, uh, who, who produces this wellness uh, You mean the, the progressive indicator or not? Maybe, yeah. yeah. Um, Genuine progress indicator, it's called. Yeah, right. Yeah, there are many. Right. There are many yeah, there are many different yeah. ones. Yeah. Of course, this is one of the most famous ones. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Happiness index. You have a. Yeah. Lot of, I, I think. Uh, I think Jason Hickel, the degrowth uh, main thinker, he he said something about it in uh, recently. He said, he said, like replacing GDP is a very important step, and and mm -hmm. you see that after like sixty years that Robert Kennedy said these words. Yeah, we are, are are arriving in, a, uh, in, a, in an area where it might be, be possible. Mm. I, I think we, we really do have some progress, but he said it won't be enough because uh, the GDP wasn't designed for nothing. It, it mm. is actually, it does fit the capitalist yeah. mode of production. Yeah. Mm. So eventually, yeah, I do think we have to go past that as well. Mm. Um, from my strategic 
uh, brother on this <laughs> part yeah. of my, he says, yeah, it probably has to be in phases and uh, it won't it won't be away tomorrow, the capitalist yeah. system. And in some parts we have, we, we have to kind of definitely in the from the ecological perspective we have mm -hmm. we have a time limit so we, we do maybe have to do some stuff in that system still um but on the long haul um uh, we have to find ways to kind of leave the leave the system mm -hmm. eventually and yeah. evolve into something more intelligent more suited to to our predicament eventually so and of course i don't have a master plan for <laughs> it but um what <laughs> Once yeah. a climate activist, yeah. a, a very old one, <laughs> told, told me to, told me when I also had my frustrations about uh, where are we going and, and it doesn't really go fast enough that he said, uh, "Boy, you're in, you're in for the long haul." <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm 87 or something. He said, and uh, I, I tell you, <laughs> do things change? But uh, this is a huge thing. You know, mm -hmm. it's not something small. Yeah. It's, uh, have patience. Yeah. Have, yeah. yeah. And just go yeah. on with it. You yeah, know? Just go uh, on with it. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's good Don't to stop even do it, on it without knowing if the, it you have depends on yeah. which side of the, 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 you have the cycle, the yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, thing with the revolu uh, revolutionaries yeah, yeah. and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. revisionists. You should have patience only if you're on the left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's yeah. important to have yeah. some people who don't have yeah. patience. Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is important yeah. to have. Yeah. Yeah. influential people who don't yeah. have patience because yeah. yeah. there is urgency yeah no of course and, and, and they need each other and uh, uh, they they can like help each other eventually in yeah. getting to that objective mm -hmm. which they all have eventually but uh, yeah it does take time yeah and and of course yeah you have to go on yes. quickly yeah at the same time <laughs> at the same time <laughs> uh, do i have time for a question quick yeah, and then after your question, let's yeah. uh, let's broaden okay. it out to the to okay. the room. Yeah, yeah. All right. yeah. Okay. So no, I, I was just actually uh, I was thinking of, of, of your your uh, thoughts on on degrowth movement, and I was thinking also in the, in the Bristol was it the, yeah. the Preston uh, the Preston Preston, Preston. Uh, Preston model, is that let's say political will for degrowth is present. Is that enough for things to change? Or is there kind of like roadblocks or walls like I could imagine? There are oil lobbies, for example, who are highly yeah. disinterested in yeah. this degrowth. So how do we uh, kind of tackle that? Or has that been a real issue? Or is there a way to co-opt uh, uh, these roadblocks? Yeah, well, uh, I think uh, it aligns a bit with the question you already uh, had, huh? that, that uh, yeah, the, the strategic elements yeah. eventually how you get there and then and, and all these obstructions you will have and eventually yeah and, and you're absolutely right these 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 uh yeah, especially these fossil fuel companies but there are many others of course where which are definitely mm. not interested in the first place <laughs> to this kind of model um which not always means that you deliberately shrink everything, but it for several for certain businesses it does mean shrinking a yeah. lot till till you <laughs> ceasing have, to exist. Yeah, to exist. <laughs> um, yeah, well, political will is of course a very important aspect, and it, it differs in which country you live how the political will is attached to these lobby interests. Yeah. Some countries it's much more than others. But in, in many, uh, you do have uh, a very strong fossil fuel lobby. Um, yeah, it, it probably is a combination of many factors. So it's a combination of, of activism, of course, it, it, trying to push the idea. I think there will never be a, a politician which says we're going to degrowth. <laughs> it will probably call something else, and, uh, but it will eventually boil down maybe to a certain agenda which degrowth uh, thinkers have. Um, some say in the degrowth movement that some are a bit more pessimistic. Yeah. They say um, a crisis could help, but some say even a crisis won't do the it work. Worse, it needs, yeah. there needs, to, yeah, it probably boils down to collapse, <laughs> and then, uh, in a sense, degrowth by disaster, and then accompanied by, okay, how could we make the disaster as as 
as uh, less uh, horrifying as possible. Yeah. It's almost this yeah. clean space fantasy all over again. Yeah. It's yeah. like we want to rebuild, but yeah. we, we just want yeah. a level ground to start from. Yeah. We yeah. don't want to deal with the mess that we have no. now. So yeah. that's... Yeah, so, yeah, and, and I, I do think many are, are realistic enough to, to know that there will never be mm. some kind of uh, delete Leveling curve. disaster, we, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, will, it will slowly get worse. And, and, and the question is then, of course, um, are there moments in which certain ideas and uh, are the ideas um, 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 well thought enough and, and, and communicated enough to to make it into the political domain and to try to kind of shift well it will be applied uh this slow collapse will be applied differently in different parts of the world yeah. so this will yeah. also probably um uh, mean that solutions will pop up in in various yeah. places that yeah. uh to address yeah. whatever the particularities of the the challenges yeah. are in that in that space and we can already see like some uh, countries for example experimenting with the the universal basic income as as one example of a, a way of um they're trialing it a bit in uh i know in canada for sure and in finland um i thought here we were also yeah, some playing small, around with it in some small places yeah, yeah very small uh, scale yeah. um but uh, again i think the, for universal basic income for example is a really good um a good way of looking at something we've been talking about again all the way through is this like stop measuring stop uh, stop trying to look for the result yeah. or yeah. just give people money and let them be you know and let yeah. them be and stop looking for oh and then are they going to sit all day in their shorts and watch cartoons oh whatever okay that's <laughs> that's probably okay i mean live and let live and 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 it sorts itself out in a way then it just uh, removes the anxiety and the kind of um yeah, the, the pain of the disparity in society yeah. between yeah. the rich and the poor. So Yeah, and I think, as you said, uh, if you really think ecologically, mm -hmm. then you know that you'll never find a blueprint of, yeah. of how to get there. You know, yeah. you'll, it's such a, a complex system and, and it's also a matter of, of trying all stuff, all kinds of stuff yeah. mm -hmm. on local, bigger level and then seeing opportunities and then yeah. the whole organism might change mm -hmm. slowly yeah. and then in a certain moments it will speed up yeah. by crisis by as you see at this moment that some stuff does speed yeah. quite well yeah. in just a, a couple of months some go the wrong direction other go a better direction mm -hmm. of course but so yeah, yeah it's it's always uh, that's also my main struggle is how to kind of relate yourself to these like yeah humongous Bigger, yeah. Uh, yeah. challenges yeah yeah, yeah. and we, we think we are in control of all of the factors but of course we no. are not and like look we at this we're not we yeah. know we're not well we yeah. kind of like to fe feel <laughs> that way yeah. maybe you know but uh, it's uh i mean look at this virus the virus which is now changing yeah. to be more contagious and less deadly because it wants to survive too because it wants to it has its own i wouldn't call it will but you know it's kind of a, a, yeah. a survival methodology yeah. that comes yeah. out yeah. and we couldn't uh, yeah well virologists would have told us yeah, yeah i could have seen this coming but a lot of us didn't see it coming at least at this moment so yeah, yeah. does anyone from the floor or anyone on social media have a question they want to okay let's uh yeah got a question from uh, john vesta and he says how can there be degrowth without population stability mm. Instability how, or stability? Oh, sorry, stability. Did I say? Yeah. How can there be degrowth without population stability, he yeah. says? So, as I understood well, he tries to connect the discussion of population growth to degrowth itself. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, well, in, in some way, there is, of course, a relationship to these two questions. Uh, on the other hand, um, one of the main ideas about the degrowth community is that eventually it's about redistribution of wealth, of income, of resources, and that these are not well, uh, yeah, that just a, a tiny minority of the, the worldwide population um, has so much resources to its, um, mm. uh, how do you say it, uh, in, in its in his box, yep. so to say. And um, that there is, in a sense, uh, plenty enough for the amount of people who live on, on this earth. Of course, 
we are not in that reality that it, it is distributed fairly. Um, on the other hand, you see that also the population growth is slowing already for quite a while. And we already are um, near a uh, peak in population growth in general, and then we will go down as well. So there is already, in that sense, a degrowth on the way um, of population in general. So, uh, of course, I think it's an important aspect, but it's a very tricky one, of course, to talk about population growth. And um, if, if you see that when uh, societies get to a certain amount of wealth, then uh, many uh, yeah, uh, families shrink till two one on one point, whatever. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you see that that already is a, uh, is a uh, development which is already on the way. So I would say, yeah, I think you might, there might be some ways to kind of uh, advance it, but that mainly would say something about exporting uh, wealth to certain parts of the global south. And then, it will do the job in that sense. Very optimistically seen, but, <laughs> yeah. but I don't see any other way of trying to address it without getting into very difficult territories mm. politically. Mm. Yeah. And then I would prefer to just try to go onto other like uh, um, yeah, okay. incentives yeah. Mm. to get to the certain same position eventually. I don't know if you have any other thoughts of it. On population instability, <laughs> I, I mean, the only question that I keep having is, is I'm, I'm all constantly envisioning this, this degrowth kind of in a context in the glo global south. And there's a lot of countries that are not fully grown adults, yeah. or, yeah. or at yeah. least by the definitions of now. Yeah. So what happens if you go yeah. like, all right, you've got to stop growing, yeah. 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 right? What, mm. what happens yeah. then? A lot of these countries are struggling with yeah. population yeah. or population growth, yeah. but the, you, you, they've inherited the system where okay, GDP equals growth. We're trying to get a to a point where it's not they're not growing out of greed; they're growing to catch up. But now there, there's more of this in the West that there's hey, actually we've grown grown enough. You guys should stop growing too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and for me, it just yeah. feels a little yeah. awkward. Yeah, you know? yeah that, that's also one of the most, uh, one of those points, uh, uh, arguments that the degrowth make is that, uh, that this is, of course, uh, something, that this is not the way. Degrowth doesn't mean everything has to degrowth. Yeah. It mainly means the global north has to degrowth, mm. and the global south needs to get more space to get to a certain, uh, yeah. to that level of wealth and, and growth. Um, and then, in that sense, the, eventually, the global north has to lead, in that sense, again, by degrowing uh, and to give more space to the global south to get to the, the level of wealth. Uh, and, and, uh, so it, 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 from a degrowth perspective, uh, it, there is a difference between how they look at it from this, the north perspective yeah. and the south perspective. Of course, how it will politically work out. Yeah, that's, that's a difference. A difficult uh, they are yeah. a bit skeptical <laughs> about... I don't see yet that willingness from mm. the global north to, mm -hmm. to go that path. Mm -hmm. But that's at least what the degrowthers um, um, yeah. say that, that they, they are um, in favor of. It's almost like it has to be a transnational collaboration, that it's, it, it's yeah. really everyone yeah. has to be part. Every, in, in, in a way, the, the globe is degrowing. Yeah. And for yeah. that to happen, yeah. there needs to be a, a, another yeah. de Redistribution, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, and and yeah, I, it, it, it does make sense to me, but yeah, politically, it's really hard to see at this moment that it will actually happen. So that's yeah. that's of course a huge challenge. Uh, yeah, but yeah, on the other hand, uh, yeah, the, the alternative is, <laughs> is even yeah. worse. Yeah. yeah, so I yeah. see. So for degrowth, we need a kind of like a Paris Agreement, but that yeah. we actually follow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. OK, yeah. sounds good. Yeah. Does anyone from the floor have any questions? I see a couple of hands in the back. So whoever's got the roving mic, if they could uh, pass it around, and uh, we'll take a couple of those questions. And then we'll, and then we'll go back to the Kim Stanley Robinson uh, video. Sure. 
Uh, yes. Uh, my question is for Abdel Rahman. Yeah. Did I get it right? Yeah. Okay. Um, bear with me as I try to make a question from some scribblings on my phone. <laughs> um, it's a question about um, diversity in companies uh, that I should introduce with a, by sharing something personal. Um, so I worked uh, for a cultural organization earlier this year for uh, two or three months where I was uh, an ethnic, ethnic minority in a team of 13 working under white management um, as someone with very little executive power, but then also uh, having been asked to uh, work on some diversity consultancy, which I did, which I may or may not have been effective. I was thanked for it, but uh, in general that experience was quite draining and I am happy to no longer work uh, there but I also took from that experience that I, well, at least for now, will not see myself working under white management or as an ethnic, ethnic minority in a white team. So this experience was quite, uh, like, um, I learned a lot. Uh, it was very stressful and draining, and it left me a bit disconcerted. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, now I have to go back to my notes. <laughs> uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, software developers. Um, yeah, okay, so when we, when we consider the biases that are embedded in technology and software engineering, or even, yeah, rather our, our, our cult culture and our government, uh, or executive powers, uh, where the norm is uh, too often cis white Western men. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, what, what should we do? Um, is it policy? Uh, do we want quota for uh, for hiring people? Because now I know that I will not, uh, like we're not all equal at the start of the race. Yeah. Uh, so f through my experience, I understand that, um, say this company would open up their doors, they would be like, yeah, no, uh, black indigenous people of color or trans people are, are responding. So we're trying, but where are they? Yeah. Um, it also makes me think of this book, uh, Participatory Culture in a Network Era by yeah. Henry Jenkins, Mizuko Ito, uh, and Dana Boyd, yeah. which speaks a bit about how um, race and class uh, uh, um, also signals which youth are facilitated and stimulated to uh, engage uh, or to be active, become active politically. Um, so I guess my uh, small or first question is like, yeah. how do you feel about uh, quota in, in, in employment? Uh, but then maybe the second question would be, uh, does it already start uh, in education and how maybe in the Netherlands or, uh, yeah, maybe you could speak a bit about uh, what role education can also play. Yeah. Um. Well, thanks a lot for sharing your, your experience. Um, I, I assume that the question is about quota and employment when it comes to like the production of technological systems, or is it in general? Yeah, yeah. I so, mean, yeah, you could speak on, on maybe software development companies yeah. or like racist AI or crowd crowdfunding yeah, software. Absolutely. But I kind of snuck in a little. <laughs> our culture at large, yeah, or you yeah. could speak I about mean, the planet too if you want, but that's something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's um, I, have, I, I want to tell you first of all that I, I have been in that position a lot. I know a lot of people have been in that position. It's hard, especially in, in my field and so many fields, to be like, all right, I, I want to work in a, in a space that is entirely safe for my position as, as, as a person of color or as a marginalized, uh, as a trans or queer person. It's It's... Not, a lot of the times, the biggest uh, thing you can do and the biggest, as, as we say colloquially, the biggest flex you can do is survive uh, within that system. Um, but what we can do as a collective, uh, you mentioned quotas in, in government and in law, and I think we should lobby for that always. But I think personally, my opinion is I often don't have so much um, trust in, in, these, in, in uh, government, uh, in, in these governing practices in general. Uh, I think we should lobby for them, but I think what we should do is that we should uh, build systems of accountability. 
that we're constantly, if we're using a product, if we're using, so something had happened with Twitter recently, and Twitter also has people of color on their executive board. And what happened is that there was a cropping problem. I don't know if you've heard of it. Is that on Twitter, whenever someone posted a picture that is too big to be shown on, on, the, on the smaller view, uh, they have an AI that chooses who uh, to show, who to show on the thumbnail. And people have been experimenting, and they're like, okay, we're just going to put you know, a, a black person and a white person, and it's going to choose the, the white person. It's going to put a light-skinned person and a dark-skinned person, it chooses the light-skinned person. And people have been collaborating and have holding people accountable for their practice. And there had been kind of a, a, a global awareness that is very fast-moving, very uh, uh, hard-hitting, that changed things. And this, in the end, changes things, I think, more than uh, laws or quotas do. But not to say that we should look away from, from uh, uh, things like quotas, because for a lot of people, people they are a lifeline. Uh, and the second thing you mentioned, education. Uh, I think education in the broader sense of, of making people uh, uh, aware or critically aware of what, what it means to be oppressed, uh, what it means to be a minority in a space where your positionality is not acknowledged. I think this kind of awareness itself, this kind of education could happen on a social level, could happen on a grassroots level. It doesn't have to be taught in a school. Um, yeah, and I, I think within the AI field, there is a, a kind of a lot of initiatives. Like there is, a, a, I don't know, like Black Girl Nerds, which is a, is a group in the US. There's Women in AI. Uh, there is all these really grassroots movements that know uh, tech has, was envisioned to be a decentralized system. Uh, the more we rely on laws, the more the, the, the system lose their integrity. Uh, so we should organize ourselves and, and really build the world that we, we want to build. It needs a lot of patience. It's, it's uh, draining, like you said. <laughs> but I, I really say again that survival in these cases is the biggest flex. Thank you. Great. Could you call it like uh, some, some call this prefigurative politics? Like you prefigure yeah. the world you want. And, and the be. laws could follow. And then you hope it will, yeah, inspire or... I mean, personally, I'm a fan of... I, I mean, I, I'm maybe not the, the best person to speak on this, but that, that's my personal conviction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think we had another question in the back. Um, can you Hello. Hello. So thank you for the inspiring talks. And I have a question and actually a comment for both of the speakers. So first of all, um, I'm an urban designer and I'm dealing with the growth and the climate change economics and how to save the future. Uh, um, <laughs> <Cool>. so, <laughs> Sounds like an easy job. Yeah. <laughs> no, Great not. Job. <laughs> that. Um, so uh, the thing is, uh, like the the code, I would like the code uh, that like it, the the growth in the global north and the growth in the global south, uh, I don't think that it will create uh, equality. And actually, I think the de degrowth ideas might uh, deepen the inequality because as we've seen before, like previous colonial uh, practices, like for example, yeah, the, there are many clothing brands that are saying like, yeah, we're doing well, but they're actually relocating their businesses to the cheaper countries or developing economies or if we're talking about economics of climate change, for example, if there will be the carbon taxes, which will be coming soon, and they will be basically exports and imports of that carbon, and uh, so relocating of the business, relocating of the bad stuff in different countries. So basically, developing countries and citizens from countries where they have a lower consumption of fossil fuels per capita, for example, will be suffering more about that. So my comment is, this is a, actually a global problem what we have, but on the other hand, I, we, I think we should uh, produce more local uh, solutions for that because, for example, a new Paris Agreement wouldn't solve it. We have to go local on that and uh, to understand the logics. So um, I would like to ask, like, would it be a kind of a bringing the topic back to the AI and back to the digital systems, for example? Mm. 
would there be a system to measure like this indicators of local and create the uh, unique solutions for that? And also, mm -hmm. I would like to get, ask your opinions about it. Um, let me check since I have the mic. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, that's oh, the question. Thanks a lot. Do you want to start? Or? Yeah, uh, uh, the, the last part was, uh, I thought it was, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, was for you in the, yeah. the first, huh? Yeah. But then you can answer. Yeah, the I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm curious <laughs> on what your, your view is it. And I'll, All right. I, might yeah. add, I might add to the first part of the question. Um, I mean, I think it's a really good point. I think it's, it's kind of questioning the degrowth movement. And you're like, maybe in the end of the day, it's going to generate more inequality. And I think on the back of my head, I was constantly thinking of pan-Africanist modes of thought. that They're, they're constantly envisioning futures for themselves. There's the, always the, say, the saying of like African solutions for African problems. It's, it's often that they don't want someone to come from the West and be like, hey, we're going to decrowth and you should do this and this is going to happen. And I think there is indigenous, there is homegrown, there are brew, uh, homebrewed imaginaries that we just need to, act, we need to invite to the conversation. That's all we need to do at a certain point. Yeah. When it comes to AI, uh, um, it, it could be an interesting challenge to, to have like a global indicator of, of how everyone is dealing with this, this problem on their own. But I think a good thing that we can do is work on, on a collaborative platform, as in like a way to share our experiences. So it's, it's your, your problem space is entirely local, but the insights that you get out of the problem space could be global, could be readopted. And that you have a transparency in the process. That, that, and I think that's also, asking a lot of a political process to be entirely transparent. Be like, please tell us the experience from the beginning to end. And I think it happened in South Africa when, when, when the constitution was being written after the apartheid. It was, it was a really uh, a collaborative process that a lot of other African countries ha ha have tried to collaborate with. And I, I think it's happening across the, co I mean, I, I know the context of, of uh, the context of Africa more than I know in other places, but I think there are systems and there are lessons that Europe can learn from Africa in that sense. I think there's an idea that we have, we have the pressure to create here because we're in Europe. We have the pressure to solve things is a little bit problematic in itself. I think we can look in the, to, the, to the south for solutions, always. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely a good question, but I do think that if you look at what the degrowth movement, the community is talking about, writing about, is that actually they do get inspired, they inspire themselves quite literally by a lot of indigenous um, global south uh, practices. So actually the, the idea about the degrowth um, in many ways comes from certain ways of uh, local economies, relationship to the natural world from these areas of the world. So in that sense, it's not entirely a Western um, idea which mm -hmm. has to kind of go over to the world and conquer it. Uh, I, I do think the degrowth community is well aware of this, 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 this um, pitfall. Um, on the other hand, you, you might question, of course, if we really would go opt for degrowth in the north, northern hemisphere. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean that we could uh, move the, grow, the growth to the south or something. But that is already what is happening at the moment. So what they call the green growth idea, that's basically if you could decouple m your growth, your GDP growth from material output in general, then you have a degrowth. That's not a degrowth society, but a society which you can still grow without having impact on the on the planet. That's the idea about the green growth. Unfortunately, there is no academic uh, <laughs> proof that it, this is possible. Uh, the opposite, more. Um, and th the main reason is that some countries say they are actually decoupling. Is that because they have shipped all kinds of uh, processes to the global south? Yeah. Um, and the degrowth movement, uh, one of the main aims is to kind of uh, reconcile that reality and, and try to find ways of getting out of that reality, that, that kind of fantasy that we can de uh, decouple growth from material output in general or the impact on the planet. 
by just shifting our productions all over the world. Uh, but I do think you raised a very important topic, of course, that this is definitely a um, challenge. Okay, and uh, with that, I think now we, we are ready to, to roll yeah. with the Kim Stanley Robinson video, so that's what we're going to do now. And then after the video, we'll see what time we have for any uh, final questions and discussion, and uh, then we can, can wrap it all up with a nice neat bow, all the solutions, all the answers, everything <laughs> solved, and go home satisfied with ourselves. So let's now hear uh, Kim Stanley Robinson. Hello, I'm Kim Stanley Robinson, and I want to greet everybody to the Fiber Festival. I wish I could be there in person uh, to meet and talk with everybody. I was last in Amsterdam in 1987, but I'm sure it's uh, still a wonderful city, and I look forward to getting back. Um, the Fiber Festival this year is concentrating, I know, on questions of um, how to go forward in an age of instability. And we certainly have the instabilities right in our face, starting now with the pandemic as a uh, sample of what can happen and how we're going to have to respond to it. And the disruption of the pandemic has been very instructive, I think. Uh, it is a destabilizing um, event that nevertheless has been responded to uh, by science and by government worldwide. Uh, and there's a bit of incoherence at the level of politics and the nation state system, but the global and international response of governments to the information that came from science is an indication of how well we can uh, respond in this century of instabilities, uh, uh, not perfectly, but well enough and it's also um, uh, uh, a sign that when we feel that we're in danger of our lives, we turn to science and government and uh, to guide us in our actions. So that in a century of instabilities, um, it's important to remember in a dialectical fashion that the stabilities that exist in human civilization are considerable. Um, agriculture, rule of law, um, peace between nations, and the continuing work of the scientific and medical communities are all stabilities that we're going to need going forward. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, climate change is an overarching uh, hammer blow to everything else that we're trying to achieve as humans on this planet and we've begun a mass extinction event that is partly implicated with climate change biodiversity loss and habitat loss for the wild animals is a crisis that we face um, and the adaptations to that have to do with uh, both uh, technology in the largest sense of the word which is not just hardware uh, tools and things, but also systems. And here again, the stabilities of language, of law, these are technologies also. And when we acknowledge them as such, as the software, we can uh, realize that the adaptations going forward are going to require not just hardware, but software. On the hardware level, we have to decarbonize our energy production and our transport and everything that we do, food production as well. We have to decarbonize as fast as we can. And every single method that has been proposed so far uh, it will not be sufficient in and of themselves, but needs to all of them be done concurrently and in a, an exploratory sense of finding which work best, which can be put to work fastest. But it's an all hands on deck situation where everything that has been discussed so far in terms of adaptations and really I don't you can't adapt to a 3C warmed world. So uh, adaptation is maybe not even the right word here, even though we are always adapting. We have to fight back. We have to mitigate in the, in the American academic philosophical community. There's ar arguments in this front between adaptation and mitigation. 
it's a distinction without an important difference, but I will just say this, we can't adapt to wet bulb temperatures above 35 C and we're already approaching them and these are fatal to human beings. And then the mass extinction event becomes something that we ourselves might join. So um, in terms of hardware, we decarbonize. There may be direct air capture. We may be pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere and either uh, uh, sequestering it or putting it to work for us in solid forms. Um, we will uh, be doing uh, all kinds of mitigation work in trying to um, reduce the melting of the ice in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And then all of the clean technologies that need to be introduced as quickly as possible. Everybody knows about these. I won't even list them here. Um, but what I want to emphasize in particular in terms of a new technology is um, a new political economy. That's the crucial technology for this coming century. Capitalism is one name for our problem. And some people are calling the Anthropocene the Capitalocene that it's the economic system that we're in that is the most destructive part of what we're doing to the earth. And it has to change. And when one says that, it's a frightening thought because capitalism rules the world right now. And neoliberal capitalism is a particularly extractive, exploitative, and unjust version. So post-capitalism, it needs to be theorized, it needs to be invented, and it needs to be enacted. One thing that I've become interested in is we have to pay ourselves to decarbonize. It won't make a profit in a capitalist sense. It is a cost. So nevertheless, we have to do it. And capital will only go where there's profit. So that means that really the central banks themselves, government creating money, creating the stability of money, speaking of stabilities, um, needs to uh, do quantitative easing based on decarbonization. This sometimes get called the carbon coin, that um, quantitative easing, the first creation of money gets spent on biosphere repair work, on decarbonization, on, on dodging the mass extinction event. And at that point, uh, the money then enters the general economy afterwards, but the first spending of it as created by the central banks, all of them together and internationally and in the big nation states, um, vast amounts of money need to be created and spent on biosphere repair so that people can afford to do it so that you can make your living doing it so that essentially humanity is paying itself to do the right things rather than making a profit from doing the wrong things. So uh, I urge everyone there to contemplate the idea of a new political economy, a post-capitalism that involves us paying ourselves to do the necessary work. Now, okay, say that becomes an agreed upon point. The, what the mechanism I think will be for this is simply the Paris Agreement and international treaties. The nation state system is another stability. It's not going to go away in the next 30 years when we need to act. So um, this will mean uh, an improvisation, but we do have many international treaties and many of them are there to protect the fish in the sea and so on and so forth. In other words, the precedent is there for the international treaty system to agree to do the necessary work to uh, get through to a prosperous time. Um, the Paris Agreement was a remarkable achievement in world history. 178 nations signed on to it. And even though their offers uh, to decarbonize were voluntary and set by themselves with no enforcement mechanism either, it uh, is nevertheless a sign of what can be done. It's a positive sign in a way that the response to the pandemic was a, a, a positive resulting from a negative. The Paris Agreement is simply one of the great moments in world history. Now, it could turn into the League of Nations of 1929. Um, in other words, a good gesture that failed. But in this case, the stakes are so high that one has to just um, um, go where we've gone so far, follow up on the Paris Agreement and make it stick. That will be the method by which we coordinate our international efforts, I believe. And then lastly, um, you know, Fiber Festival, the arts, the sciences, what can the arts do in this situation to um, alert people to what's going on? Well, for me, being a science fiction writer, it's um, 
this is like handing a, a carpenter a hammer or something. I, I insist that the best way is in the telling of stories. That we tell, we're in a discursive battle to make this version of uh, the next 30 years the one that actually gets enacted so that we dodge a mass extinction event and a hammering of human civilization. So um, that, that discursive battle is necessary because there are people who still don't believe it, who have not acknowledged the realities of the planetary biosphere situation, and who will fight heartily and vigorously against um, the adjustment of humanity to the planet's biosphere. It's too bad, but um, it's not gonna go away just because it's unfortunate. It is a discursive battle that we need to engage in at every moment from now on. So this is what art does. Art is not just for fun. Art is entertainment that it combines with um, creation of meaning. It is um, uh, not just education, but creation of meaning in the sense of a religion. Uh, literature is my religion, and I believe that everybody lives by the stories that they tell, the meaning that we create out of life, which in some existential sense is something we have to create ourselves. It isn't given to us by the universe. That comes out of the stories that we tell each other. So the discursive battle is on. It's going to be intense. The 2020s, I mean, many people at this festival will be young for sure, um, inquiring, um, um, interested to see if they can work on the larger context of their lives, meaning the civilization we're all going to be living in. And in that context, um, the stories that we tell each other and spread outward to the people who still haven't gotten it uh, are going to be crucial. And that's where art has its intervention. So as an artist, as a science fiction writer from California, I'm in a peculiar situation. Um, but I will say this, uh, uh, similarly to uh, Holland, uh, uh, to the Netherlands, uh, California is a remarkable achievement in moving water around, in uh, technological terraforming of a landscape to make it easier on humans in a sustainable long-term way and also a fairly uh, progressive and forward-looking politics. Um, these are nation states to be proud of, I think, and um, they can serve as examples. So in every uh, situation like this, this the, the political entities that have, um, um, that are doing the right things. And, and here I should quickly mention that doing things at the community level is where the individual can maybe make the most impact as an individual. So it isn't just global international and the public banks, but also the town council, the um, common gardens, the work of individuals in their communities of kind of bottom up changing of the world, which is, means that individuals have a little more impact that they can see. All these things uh, can combine, and this is the ultimate, I think, underlying uh, stability that we have to count on in the unstable times that are coming. So with that, I, I, um, I wish you well. I will hope to hear reports from this festival and, uh, and maybe someday uh, get back to Amsterdam myself. So thank you very much, and signing off from the coast of Maine. Nice. Well, I'm glad uh, we got this uh, uh, strong appeal and uh, um, actually uh, really underscoring what, that what we're doing and um, in terms of language, in terms of art, is um, is maybe the right thing to do after all. We had a moment, a wobble, a moment of doubt earlier. The the, the inevitable is what we're doing, uh, the most urgent thing uh, earlier. And uh, but now I. Th I feel vindicated after <laughs> having listened to Kim Stanley Robinson. So, um, so I think now at this at this point we're we're winding up. We're reaching the end of our our program. Um, uh, what I'm going to ask to happen now is a little bit of shuffling in the spaceship. So we're going to kind of shuffle the crew around a bit. Jarl is going to come back to 
the stage and join me. Uh, maybe the, the two of you are, are panelists. Let's, let's thank you, first of all. So thank you for your wonderful talks. Um, you can find a spot in our, uh, uh, I don't know what to call this. This is the spaceship. That's the, well, that's outer space, actually. I'm kicking you out into outer space. <laughs> find yourself a spot, and Yara will come join me on the stage to do a little wrap-up. Welcome back into the back into the spaceship. So that I mean I think um, the, that final video uh, statement from Kim Stanley Robinson is really uh, nicely tied together a lot of the loose ends for us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have to do the work. <laughs> No, I really appreciated, um, as he was speaking also, when he was saying this is an all-hands-on-deck moment, um, I, I have to, as a Canadian, I'm obliged to mention Marshall McLuhan at yeah. least uh, once every uh, 24 hours, and so I'm reminded, <laughs> <laughs> I'm reminded of him saying, you know, there are no passengers on Spaceship Earth, we are all crew. And uh, if, if there was ever a time for that, for McLuhan to be right, you know, like a stopped clock, he's right twice a day, it's, you know, you have to... Yeah. Uh, you have to give him credit that that was uh, maybe a sentiment now for our times. Um, but I think another, and another thing that I pulled out of not just what um, Kim was saying, but also some of the other themes that came through um, over the course of the five sessions, it came through again and again that uh, we have to work on our discourse, our language, we have to be convincing, uh, we have to talk more with each other. Um, and uh, try to, as, as uh, Kim called it, a discursive war. We have to yep. start fighting this discursive war. Um, and that uh, the word extractive, if I you know, heard it uh, once, I heard it dozens of times, it's, uh, it's something that we're now so aware of as something that we're doing, uh, that how extractive our practices are. So to win this discursive war against that is something with great urgency, I think. Um, yeah, and also, if I may add, um, thinking about uh, uh, Milton uh, Alma Asit, who if we met uh, last year uh, within our Cartography Soft Vanishing Now Lab, that he also mentioned, as same as Suzanne was saying earlier in her presentation, that we tend to have this idea of like making something and building something and inserting something, designing something, when the whole part of the other part of the whole world is listening and 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 just also what Suzanne had the mi reverse microphone it's like it's like we we are coming in this phase of where we have to kind of step back also and listen and contemplate and not every time kind of do and design and make better as also Daisy mentioned uh, in her presentation so that's for me a very interesting thing also connected to the topics on the table here yeah the idea of slowing down taking time to listen um, being quiet <laughs> sorry, I had to say it again. This is an inside, uh, sorry, joke <laughs> for people living in the Netherlands uh, about Mark Rutte. Um, but also, uh, and I, I heard also again and again the idea that uh, colonization never stopped. And this is something that I think um, is important to phrase it in that way. We talk about decolonizing, but if the process is ongoing, it's something we have to take into consideration as a, uh, it's kind of more complicated than it looks. The colonization tendency is still not only there, it's still happening. So we have to be very careful about how we, how we proceed. And that involves a lot of listening and making space, yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 Um, in terms of any other kinds of themes that came into the table, I think uh, there was a lot of, um, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to think about what uh, there was the mention of languages and movements. Perhaps it's something that it's uh, difficult in this moment of Corona because we're here tenuously gathering. It's been very difficult and with a lot yeah. of great uh, care and effort, we've managed to come together as a group, but um, really seeing the importance of that uh, as, a, as a way to avoid getting more isolated and more depressed and more apathetic, I think. Yeah, yeah I think so. I've also been talking with audience that we have these five sessions where 30 people come in and we rotate and some people stay and some people leave. But the general this talk is that everybody's super happy to be together and have these conversations. And that's what we try to set out with this festival, to kind of do something that was in the space of kind of like having a safe space and an online space and also having sp and having speakers that, that didn't need to fly in also, which was, we never talked about kind of zero carbon, but uh, yeah. uh, we always talked about like cutting out the flights and that kind of stuff. But now we come up with this and actually a lot of speakers are also super happy that they didn't have to travel for one talk and go back. Um, 
But the conversations were really nice. And although they are smaller, they're not less valuable. And I think that's also an interesting thing of doing this, this type of festival. And as we say also, we, we we're discussing also in the team and also with Rianne and about kind of like creating this kind of slow festival that is kind of, it doesn't stop now. It, 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 there's so many conversations that we can return to and work on and maybe uh, stay with this theme and, and, and dive back into it. So this is, yeah, for us also a starting point for kind of a longer trajectory. And I think that's, from a festival perspective, quite interesting because festivals are always like new, 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 new. <laughs> traditional kind of of course everybody does other things and there's also festivals that are not doing it but that's kind of the model and uh, it's interesting to to be in this space now and to think about also ourselves and uh, and uh, how we move forward yeah, yeah. and also uh, another thing that came up and i think that fits with your slow festival idea is the idea that we have to uh, for things to catch on we have to do them and say them again and again and make make a kind of practice out of it. It becomes uh, like a muscle that you build up. It's not like we just jump in and say, all right, we're, we're ready to, to decolonize all our systems now. We're ready to you know, be more responsible now. We're ready to talk about degrowth now. We have to implant the idea and work on it slowly, day by day. So this yeah. is part yeah. of that. You there's know? a lot of work to do. If there's yeah. a lot of work yeah. to do. <laughs> there is. Yeah. And, um, I think it's 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 also the, the the right moment to thank everybody that has been making this possible. Uh, the whole team has been working super hard on this. Uh, Rian uh, working together with me on the program, you being with us, and uh, everybody also in the Dolhuis Town who's been running the exhibition and the volunteers. Uh, it's been a crazy ride because we were supposed to do it in May, and now a half year later we're doing this, which is completely different, uh, but very special to do. So my big thanks to the team. Uh, the audience, but also all our partners and sponsors that made this happen. Um, uh, I don't have time to go into all of them, but they show up on the slides and you can visit them on the website. They are very big supporters of what we do. And uh, it's been a very special fifth edition and a 10th year anniversary. Like, what a birthday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I also want to thank you. Oh. Thank you very much for joining us and yeah. helping us through the, the, the talks. Um, please give uh, her big applause. <laughs> it's it's funny to be on the spaceship instead of pacing around the stage for exactly. sure. Exactly, it's yeah. a new mode that we're doing yeah, it's this. A new mode. It's super good to be I together. I also want to mention it's nice to be back in the house at the Brecha Courant yeah, exactly. because it's uh, you know of course when we were re planning the festival it was of course unsure what could happen you know it could be completely uh, online all of us uh, at home whatever you could have dreamed up anything but it's really nice to be back here in the house so yeah yeah um, it's also a good time to mention that we need support so if uh, people are, are interested to yeah. pay what they wish for the experience of seeing the festival stream that they can go to fiberfestival.nl yeah. slash pay and, and uh, donate what they feel is uh, uh, what they wish. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, we decided to keep this open because we think it's an important conversation not to have kind of a paywall on it. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean that it's always weird with this word free. Of course, what is free? <laughs> but we, this is value and we hope that people support us to do it and support the artists and support the crew. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And with that, I think we can uh, wrap up this uh, final session um, and proceed on to, well, we now have an epilogue that we can uh, yeah. present. Uh, uh, Bayo Akomolefe uh, is going to, it's another video message. Sorry, what? Yeah, it's now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're, we're going to close. We're going to get up and stretch our legs, which I'm sure we're all really excited to do. And then uh, we, we can settle into our seats and watch the epilogue uh, video from Bayo. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then after that, tonight we have performances. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the performances. Yeah, there's two uh, performances, one by Mark Eisenman, Sebastian Robert, and one by Van der Welle. Both um, work with um, the, uh, the created environments, uh, and they translate, for instance, deforestation and coastal erosion into two concerts. Um, and um, we're also going to live stream it. So, um, of course, we have a very limited capacity here, uh, but it will be online. Uh, unfortunately, it's sold out, but you can still watch it on the stream. And after this um, closing of Bio, we also have um, a, a two hours video art stream, which is called the Instability Stream. Uh, we have also had three blocks before, four blocks. Um, 
Uh, and there's a selection of artists who send in their work uh, and we made a selection and present uh, from uh, abstract videos from Sena van der Broek to uh, a very nice uh, uh, interview, um, um, video from Deborah Mora. And it's good to mention also that because our video was cut off yesterday due to some small technical things, we're going to resend it with the performance program so she gets an even better stage. Great, nice. <laughs> Great, all right, and with that, so just thank you everyone for coming and riding on this, uh, this new hybrid format with us. Thank you, uh, we're now going to break. Uh, let's all have a round of applause. <laughs> For everyone. And now we'll have a stretch and then our statement from, uh, our epilogue from bio. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bayo Akomalafe, and I am speaking to you from India. And I want to thank the organizers of uh, Fiber Festival for inviting me to share my thoughts, however briefly, about the instabilities, the upheavals, the ruptures of our time, and perhaps to seed an invitation within this rupture, uh, within this geometaphysical opening in the earth. Um, like I said, I speak to you from India where I make my home and my family and my life with um, those that I love in my community here in Egmore, Chennai. And um, there are many questions that are afoot in these times about the coronavirus pandemic. Um, India is number three in the world at the moment in terms of um, infection rates. Um, and it's increasing by the day, actually. So we're still in some form of lockdown, not quite official, um, but we're still in some, um, there's still a sense of alarm and danger, if you will. Um, and I've been asking questions about the pandemic, as I'm sure you have as well. People ask, what does this mean? Is this just an epidemiological phenomenon? Is this just a matter of viruses, uh, microbial enemies that we should eradicate as soon as possible? Is this just an issue with um, finding a vaccine? Or is there something else that, is, that should be considered in these, in, in these times, in these moments? Is there something else that we want to talk about? Um, I wrote an essay called I Coronavirus uh, monster, mother monster activist, in which I expounded upon um, the idea that some other things might want to be discussed at this time. And one of those things is the idea that this is not just a pandemic of the epidemiological variety, that this is a critique of the Anthropocene, if you will. This is almost like a transversal event disrupting the stability of the human. Now, what do I mean by the human? Um, when we speak about the human, we are mostly referring to the bipedal figures that we identify ourselves as, um, with one head and two arms and two legs, normatively. Um, but there is another sense in which the human um, exceeds this isolated image of the human. By the human, I mean a colonial paradigm. I mean a geographical paradigm. I mean a geological paradigm. I mean a way of being in the world that has tended to supplant the wildness, the feminine wildness of the world, um, and has tended to impose an imperial order uh, whose effects is to create a stable world where the individual, the individuated self, can thrive in a milieu of liberalism. So I do not just mean the atom, I mean the entire soup. I mean the transatlantic slave trade. I mean the discourses of the Enlightenment. I mean the idea that time should be framed as a progression from the past to the present to the future. I mean the idea that we're separate from ecology, that we are 
um, free, that we're free, um, and that we owe no debt to the world around us. We're not indebted to the world around us. We are, um, we are pixels um, in a picture, and we can transgress the picture anytime we want. That the sacred is far away. Um, that the gods and goddesses of archetypal fame are just, just a way of speaking. That are that that is um, that is impoverished in the face of empirical realism, hard facts of real of reality, and that science is the only way to frame truth. Is the only way to frame reality. Um, is the only way to frame knowledge. If you want to get serious about knowledge, or about sense making, about meaning, the only way to do that is through science. Now, all of these ideas come together to form an assemblage, constellate to form um, a category of thought, uh, or a way of thinking, uh, a way of relating to ourselves and to the world that I, ident that I identify as the human. And this human um, is what I feel is under siege, that, the, that what we call the Anthropocene, you know, in some quarters, is really a way of naming and indexing the deleterious effects of this landscape, this ecological principle that is the human. Um, with this, we want to think about modernity, that modernity isn't just um, some kind of superior arrangement of bodies in society. It is in line with what I've just said about the human, it is this paradigm that we have co-invented with the non-human um, that is about creating stable bodies, stable citizens, stable subjects with pre-relational identities, um, with, uh, with fixed names, with fixed positions in a spatial-temporal um, space, in a spatial-temporal realm um, that is devoid of entangling nonsense like spirituality and sacredness and messiness. Now, I come from an indigenous people in Nigeria that see the world as exceeding those rational techno-bureaucratic frameworks of thinking. I see the world as vital, as animated, as alive in more ways than one. So that this virus is not just a virus, if you will. The COVID-19 virus is more than a virus. Um, I hesitate to name what it is. That's not the point of this. But to investigate the way we see the world and the way we relate to it. I believe in some sense that this virus is a rendering unstable of our bodies. There are actually some theories that presuppose or suggest that the virus is an opening of our bodies in terms of rendering our bodies more porous. And I think that is what, um, that is where decoloniality lies today. The work of our times is not to achieve justice in the liberal, modern, inflected senses with which we understand that ideal. The work of our time is to lose shape, is to investigate our instability, is to come undone is to shape shift to other forms of being alive in the world that is wiser, probably potentially wiser than the ways that our modern civilization, our globalizing modern context has framed us. And this is then an invitation to become fugitives. And that is what I hear when I hear the phrase becoming unstable. It is becoming unintelligible. It is becoming invisible. It is losing our way long enough to be found in different ways or to be found by the world in different ways. It is noticing that we are not at the center of the room. We are not the prime holders of agency. We are embedded in networks of becoming. And I feel that is the powerful medicine of this pandemic, if I could speak of it as medicine, ironically. Um, because of the tragedy and the suffering that has also been occasioned by this pandemic. 
Um, this is a time for us to lose our way. Now, I do not have enough time to tell you about what losing our way might imply. But when my people say the times are urgent, let us slow down. They are probably suggesting not just to reduce our speed in a bid to get to the places we're already trying to get to, but to find other ways of becoming in the world, to fall away from the highway and to lose our way through the cracks and crevices around us, those cracks which we have tried to pathologize or name as evil or name as bad. As a black man from Africa, um, from Nigeria to be specific, now living in India, um, I know what it is to have one's face pressed to the ground. I know what it is to be denied power. I know what it is to be denied agency. We're living in not just the times of a pandemic, but in the times of George Floyd, in the times of uh, the Niger Delta oil spills. We're living in a time of the Anthropocene, when we're noticing that the myth of progress is hollowing out and we will need new stories to get along with or to take us deeper into the new. Now, we cannot do this unilaterally. We need a place where we encounter the world, where we meet the world halfway, with the words of Karen Barad. And this is an invitation then um, to hear, to listen, to notice ourselves differently, to embark on fugitive expeditions into the wilds beyond our fences, where we might become otherwise, where we might notice ourselves as not superiors or, or, or lords of the realm, but humble participants in a cosmos that exceeds us. Becoming unstable is losing our way so that we might become intelligible in other ways that are yet to be articulated. Thank you for listening.